in his first sermon, the Buddha really covers everything that is essential about his teaching. Everything that he said later in his ministry is contained within this first sermon. And the first sermon revolves around what we call the Four Noble Truths. And the first noble truth is the truth of Dukkha. This word Dukkha does not have an exact translation in English. Some people have translated it as suffering, but it doesn't really cover the whole range of the word Dukkha. Yes, it is suffering, as we have it in English. Suffering, physical suffering when you get sick, when you get hurt, mental suffering of mental pain and anguish, mental disturbances. But it's also much more subtle than that. And the minor frustrations which we experience in our daily life, the moments of dissatisfaction, the irksome routine, the feeling sometimes this is, you know, this is not very, I'm not very satisfied with this. All of these things are part of dukkha. And in this first sermon, the Buddha gives us three kinds of dukkha. He talks about dukkha dukkha, which is plain, straightforward suffering as we understand the English word. Sickness, old age, death, pain, sorrow, woe, lamentation, grief, despair. That is one form. Second form of dukkha is called viparinama dukkha, the suffering caused by change. One of the hallmarks of the Buddha's teaching is that everything is impermanent. There's nothing within us or outside us that you can look around and see which is permanent. Everything is changing. Some things change very rapidly. Um, a bubble of soap suds lasts just a second or two. Uh, granite lasts much longer, but sooner or later it will decay. There's nothing that is not subject to this law of impermanence. That by itself is not a problem. The problem arises because we want to try to make things permanent. We find something that we think is a source of happiness for us, that we like, that we enjoy, and we want it to last forever. That is the problem. That when it changes, as it will sooner or later, then we feel unhappy. We were attached to something Maybe something trivial, but it may also be something major. And when it changes, then there can be all sorts of problems. So we may think that, ah, if only I had the right job, I would be truly happy. And maybe you eventually get what you think is the right job, and then the next week the company goes bust. And so there's, there's grief and unhappiness because of that. Even friendships and relationships, they will eventually be broken, at least by one party dying. But they may also break up earlier than that. So what the Buddha was saying is that you cannot find permanent, lasting happiness from impermanent things. And that does not mean that we cannot enjoy impermanent things, but acknowledge that they are going to change sooner or later. So, enjoy something that you have now, but don't be shocked, don't be disappointed when change 
happens. It will happen. So be realistic in your expectations. Don't go looking for permanent happiness from impermanent causes. Then the third form of dukkha is called Sankara dukkha. The suffering of what we call conditioned states. And I don't know if everybody has now this little chart of headed samsara. Anybody not got it from last week? This is how the Buddha analyzed our self. And on one level, there's a breakdown between physical and mental. Rupa, the physical, Nama, the mental. And then the next level, there's still Rupa, but now the mental side is divided into sensation, perception, predispositions or mental forces, and consciousness. These five are what he called the five Kanda. You will find that word on the left-hand side of the page. The five aggregates. This is how he defines a human being. We are a combination of these five Kandas, which are mental and physical forces. Rupa is the physical side, which is broken down, in fact, into first of all four primary elements and then another 24 secondary elements. So yes, there are, there are 28 kinds of rupa. We didn't, don't need to concern ourselves with the great details there. But then <clears throat> the mental side is divided into sensation, which is what arises when one of your senses comes into contact with its appropriate object. So you can get a, you put your hand on something very hot, you get an unpleasant sensation. You put a piece of delicious food in your mouth, you get a very pleasant sensation. Then there's sanya or perception, the process of knowing things, perceiving things. Then there are another <coughs> um, 50 um, qualities which can arise in the mind. Things like greed, hatred, ignorance, goodwill, unselfishness, kindness, compassion, things like concentration, um, attention. All of these are put under the heading of Sankara. And then finally there is consciousness, vijnana, which is the receptacle for vedana, sanya, and sankara. Consciousness only arises when a process of perception has taken place, or is taking place. Conscious is not something that is always present, unchanging. It arises when, for example, your eye comes into contact with a visible object. And that sets in motion a process and you can identify what it is you are seeing. That we call visual consciousness. And so with the other senses as well, auditory consciousness, tactile, ideational, olfactory. All senses has, have a corresponding consciousness, but there's no arising of consciousness without one of these senses being involved. I think the analogy I gave you last week is that fire, cannot be just simple, plain fire. 
it has to be in association with wood, coal, gas, petrol, some other thing has to be present. You cannot have fire just by itself. And similarly, you can't have just consciousness all by itself. Now these five aggregates, we grasp at the aggregates. If you look at the Buddha's first sermon on the right-hand page, page 93, the second paragraph, the last clause is, in brief, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. The five khandhas. It's not, the, it's not the khandhas themselves which are the problem, it is the act of grasping or being attached to them. Because we invest these five qualities with the notion of I. I am this. Or this is mine. This belongs to me. Or this is my self. The Pali words are <coughs> tanha, mana, and diti. Because we make these three mistaken attempts to grasp at the aggregates, that gives rise to dukkha. We think, wrongly, that we are solidly existing persons. But the Buddha's analysis is that we are simply a process. We are an event. We're not something static. He said that uh, human life is like a river. It flows on and on and on. It's never static, never, never unchanging. It's always moving, moving, moving. But we try to grasp onto this and make it something static, solid, and enduring. <coughs> we can't do that, but we think we can. So the definition of an individual is, I think, very, very well expressed in Dr. Rahul's uh, book, where he, in his book about um, what the Buddha taught, and he says there, what we call I, or being, is only a combination of physical and mental aggregates, khandhas which are working together interdependently in a flux of momentary change. That's impermanence. Within the law of cause and effect. And there is nothing permanent, everlasting, unchanging and eternal in the whole of existence. So this is a very different view from the view that most of us in the West have of an individual. We like to think generally that here's me, this is, I, 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 I know who I am, I mean, here's me, I, I definitely exist. But what, this, this is an alternative view of things that actually we're nothing more nothing less, but we are a process which is moving on and moving on and moving on and moving on. From moment to moment, these aggregates arise and pass away. And from moment to moment, new aggregates arise and pass away. But you can't 
hold on to it anywhere and say that, that's static, that's, that's solid, that's unchanging. You're all looking suitably puzzled by that. Does it make any sense? And if you want to ask some question about that, please do. It's a very different way of looking at the, the definition of an individual. We tend to think that something like the consciousness always exists, like this board always exists, and then experience is like writing on the board. Certain experiences <coughs> are marked onto the consciousness. But that is not the Buddhist explanation. The consciousness only arises when one of these senses is stimulated and then you get your visual or auditory or gustatory consciousness arising. And when that process has finished, another consciousness can arise. So, you can only have one object in the mind at any one time. You may think that you see something and you hear something simultaneously. In fact, you don't. There's a moment of visual consciousness followed very, very rapidly by a moment of auditory consciousness, then another moment of visual consciousness, another moment of auditory consciousness. These processes, let say millions, take place in a split second. So it's far too rapid for us to break down and see. You have to have the mind of somebody like the Buddha to be able to do that. So the, the, the summary that the Buddha gives us of his, of his definition of dukkha is also, in that same second paragraph, the penultimate clause. Not to get what one wants is suffering. So every time you fail to get what you want, that is a kind of dukkha. And that covers a whole huge range of different experiences covers the big, big problems like having nowhere suitable to live or not getting better from some serious, serious illness down to the minor frustrations like you would get up in the morning and you can't find where you put your socks. Um, minor things. That may not be suffering as the English word suffering means, but it is still dukkha. So dukkha is the universal experience. Note how this, this is uh, phrased. The noble truth of suffering is this. He's not saying you are suffering and you are suffering or you are suffering. He's saying this is, this is the truth. Suffering exists. It's not personalized. It's a universal experience. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter how much money you have or power you have or anything else. You are still caught up in dukkha. Some forms of suffering you can avoid uh, if you have sufficient money. You won't starve. Um, you may be able to afford expensive medical treatments to deal with various illnesses. Certainly today, the average man is living at a much higher level than he did two and a half thousand years ago in India. But dukkha is still just as present today as it was then, because we still have old age, sickness, death, and we still fail to get what we want. So that is why the Buddha's teaching is as valid today as it was then. <coughs>